Well, June is Pride Month, and I thought it'd be good to sit down and talk with you today. Um, you know, you, for everybody who doesn't know, um, Rich Maddalena is our county's uh, chief administrative officer and the first openly gay CAO in the state of Maryland, following on being the first openly gay person in the state legislature. And uh, you've been a fighter in, in the lead for LGBTQ plus rights from your days in the state Senate, as well as during your run for the governor. And uh, you have a history um, that I'm sure makes you very proud, and I'm really happy to have you serving in my administration. And uh, just want to give you, you know, a little chance to talk about this Gay Pride Month, and you know, you've certainly been a significant leader in the state. So, well, where do we go? Thank you. That's very kind of you. Those remarks were very kind of you, and. You know, it's always been a pleasure to be a, a resident of Montgomery County when it comes to these issues because we have definitely been a leader within the state, within the nation, on equality for LGBTQ plus people. And make no mistake, you've been there all the way. I mean, from your days on the Tacoma Park City Council when Tacoma Park was, you know, a leader <laughs> on this issue, an outlier on this issue, um, going back to the 80s and 90s yeah. to um, your service on the county council, um, your efforts to make sure, working with so many other people in this community, that Montgomery County would have a blowout victory for marriage equality on, on question six in 2012. Um, so uh, it, it's been impressive to think back over just these few short years. In the year 2000, not that long ago, yep. the only mention of gay people in the state code was to criminalize our existence. Here we are, 23 short years, and we've moved light years in advancement. Um, and uh, it was thanks to the people of Montgomery County. I mean, that's the, yeah. the elected leadership, just the citizens, the residents, the voters of Montgomery County overwhelmingly have continually supported this movement and propelled our county, our state, and our nation forward. Yeah, you, you mentioned uh, Tacoma Park. You know, we started with uh, legislation to recognize domestic partnerships. And mm -hmm. we were confronted with a situation where um, people that a lot of us knew had partners who had gotten sick and wound up in a hospital. Mm -hmm. And they had the experience of, say, a parental member like a mother or a father saying, telling the hospital that mm -hmm. uh, you can't let that person's partner in here mm -hmm. because they're not part of a family. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we decided we'd allow the dom domestic partnerships because that gave it an official sanction and recognition mm. to this being as, you know, this would be an illegitimate family unit. For my part, I have never understood since time I was a kid why people even care about this. This is yep. like people's perfect right to be whoever they are and why people get all wound up mm. over people being gay or not gay. It's like, mm. what's the big deal, folks? You all look the same to me. Well, and, and, um, Someone whose life we've celebrated this year, Sheila Hickson, yeah. longtime member of the House of Delegates from <clears throat> Tacoma Park, Silver Spring, yeah. a true leader on this issue. I think the first time she put in the anti-discrimination bill at the state level, she was the only sponsor. Wow. You know, now you would probably wind up with more than 100 co-sponsors in the, in the House of Delegates for, for that type of legislation. Um, I remember in 2004, as a member of the House of Delegates, working with Montgomery County legislators, John Herson, who was a delegate yeah. and the majority leader at that time, and uh, Delegate Ann Kaiser, who's still a member of the House representing um, the 14th District, so Olney, Burtonsville, Damascus. Um, well, uh, I remember Ann and I working on this bill that came about because a couple from California had come to Maryland. They were just on a drive around the country. Um, the one of the two guys did have a chronic illness. They had every document that you needed then. <clears throat> the power of attorney, the living will, all of those things with them. Um, one falls ill um, in Harford County. They're taken to a hospital in Harford County. Um, as his illness worsens, he's transported by helicopter to shock trauma to the University of Maryland Medical System in Baltimore. The, his um, partner at the time drives to Baltimore. All the paperwork left at the hospital in Bel Air. And they wouldn't let him in to see his partner as he lay dying. And he spent the last few hours of his life alone 
with his partner just on the other side of the door, but the hospital wouldn't let him in. That was 2003. You know, it's hard to imagine a hospital being so cold to say, to say no, where's the paperwork? Prove who you are. You know, it's because we've stood up in, in Maryland, so many different people to say that was wrong, that we've changed it and moved it forward to full marriage equality yeah. for same gender couples. It's, it is hard to imagine. I mean, mm -hmm. you would think that organization like a hospital would have natural empathy, that mm -hmm. they'd understand the importance mm -hmm. of, you know, being with somebody particularly in their worst and most difficult moments. And to, to put blinders on and just kind of say, well, mm -hmm. but this relationship's not legitimate. I mean, who's to say what relationship's yeah. legitimate? Yeah. You know, and why do people feel the need to do that? Which is, which is why it's so great that so many people in this community have been willing to ask those questions and to make changes. Not just yep. ask the questions, not just sit back and say, I think this is wrong, but actually take affirmative action to change it at the municipal level, at the county level, and then at the state level. And then, you know, the, our work on marriage equality in Maryland, um, I always want to remind people, uh, our work in Maryland, the, the fact that we were the first state to pass this through the legislature, then the first state to get it approved by the voters, that it was a couple from Ohio that came to Maryland because they couldn't get married in Ohio. They came to Maryland to get married and then went back to Ohio when, again, Ohio would not recognize that relationship. They went to court, the Obergefell decision as it's known, is what is the court case that said actually marriage equality for same gender couples um, is, is the law of, for the entire country. So that effort in Mar our effort in Maryland did transform the entire country on marriage equality. But you know, we, we, were, we were ahead on adding sexual orientation to the anti-discrimination law, then adding gender identity to the anti-discrimination law in Montgomery County first and then, and then statewide. I mean, across the board, many of the policies that originated here moved to the state and have moved to, all, to most of the country, if not, all of the country because of the, the good work and the long yeah. support here. And it, it, it's in our DNA in Montgomery County. I, I don't think people realize that in the 1960s when civil, when civil rights uh, around race was the major issue, um, there was a referendum <coughs> on um, adding um, discrimination in public accommodations and housing um, and making sure that racial discrimination in public accommodations like a restaurant, a movie theater and housing would be against the law in Maryland. That got petitioned to referendum, and that failed in most of the state. It passed overwhelmingly in Montgomery County and became the law of the land because of that. So over, you know, Montgomery County is on the forefront of issues of social justice and equality on issue after issue and for decades. I think, you know, of how much Montgomery County has changed, you know, use this statistic for, you know, being the 95% white county in 1970 mm -hmm. and, you know, now being 44% and that we've managed this remarkable change with the diversity of people coming here. And uh, it's been done as if this was just normal. Yes. And that we don't get a lot of pushback out of that. Mm -hmm. There are always some people who will push back against anything that's different, but most people are just kind of like, well, that's just who we are. And mm -hmm. most people are proud and happy that you can say that your kids go to school with all kinds of different people and mm -hmm. it's just part of the normal complex. But I wonder, you know, when, when we did our bill at the, at the city level, we got some pushback, but it was not, you know, I wouldn't say it was extraordinarily difficult. Mm -hmm. I think none of us were worried about, oh my God, we're going to do this and mm -hmm. what's going to happen in the next election. I'm just wondering, like, from, from where you sat in the state legislature, what was it like going from zero miles an hour to 60 miles an hour? How did, how did that transformation take place and how did you feel amidst all that? Well, for a long time, I thought it wouldn't <laughs> happen and we were playing defense. I mean, when I was first in the legislature, it was about stopping the negative constitutional amendment from going on the ballot. We probably all remember in 2004, the George W. Bush campaign for re-election pushes mm. these constitutional amendments <clears throat> around the country. There was a big push in Maryland to get that done. And so our work initially was, how do we stop this from occurring? 
and then it was interesting we were able to move the conversation away from defense to offense and i remember the advice that brian frosh then a state senator from montgomery county then most recently the last eight years our attorney general um, in maryland until just recently retiring um, brian saying to me in his time in the legislature he always saw that the pivot came so fast you know that you'd be sitting year after year fighting that uphill battle and then all of a sudden it would change dramatically and it was just like that it j just a momentum occurred right after the um, 2010 state election and things just changed and part of it was martin o'malley was willing to to push it and stand up and fight as governor um and you know just like paris glenn denning had stood up and fought for the anti-discrimination law um, as governor. Um, if I can tell a little story yeah. about Governor Glenn Denning, I think one of the moving <clears throat> moments that really started to change people's minds in the legislature about the anti-discrimination bill, he had a younger brother who died of HIV AIDS. Um, and um, the Paris, the governor um, went to visit him in the hospital as he lay dying. And his brother said to him, um, he had been a, an Air Force officer, a decorated Air Force officer, and then um, forced out of the, the military. Um, and he, he said, even though HIV AIDS and all of the health complications that came with it, which led to his passing, was painful and debilitating, it was nothing like the pain that he suffered each day in silence as having to serve in the closet in the United States Air Force. And he asked Governor Glenn Dunning if he ever had the chance to make sure other people didn't feel that same pain, he needed to take it. That's why well, Governor Glenn Dunning pushed forward with that anti-discrimination law and why you know, he was successful in it. And that changed the hearts and minds of people to hear those sorts of, of, of stories. And that's, you know, and anyone um, would be fearful of and I remember actually when I walked into this building, even though I knew Montgomery County had rules and laws, um, as, as a young person starting to work for, for the county in 1995, I was worried what would happen to me, what would be my career opportunities if, if it was discovered I was gay. It took a long time to come out here. I think that's changed dramatically. I, don't, I think people are comfortable walking in to this building as an employee on their first day, yeah. putting a picture of them with their with their same gender spouse and their family on the desk and and everyone smiles and says, nice to meet you. <laughs> you know, so it's been that, that sort of transformation within this organization that I, I know I'm proud of, I'm sure you're proud of. Yeah. Um, because it's, it, there, it's more common than it was, but we were, again, we were a leader in that sort of welcoming environment. Like it's one of the things I like about being county executive here. Um, mm -hmm where we don't have to struggle with some of these fundamental issues that, mm -hmm. you know, whether we're dealing with immigrant rights or gay rights or, you know, civil rights in general, um, it's just so generally accepted mm -hmm. that we don't feel like we're, you know, having to pull people along or fight upstream mm -hmm. to, to do this work. And it mm -hmm. means you can actually do the work and not spend a lot of time having to debate and fight for it. Mm -hmm. That there's just a general acceptance. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you can walk to an office and it's like one more picture, and yeah, mm -hmm. no, nobody thinks anything mm -hmm. of it. When when you're in the legislature, though, I mean, since you didn't start with everybody jumping up and down and say, "Let's go mm -hmm. here," so what was the personal trans transition like? I mean, you must have had relationships with people who eventually came to say, you know, perhaps I was wrong about this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, I, I don't think there was there was anyone more. Um, uh, vocal about that than Mike Miller, the longtime Senate Senate right. president, um, who on <clears> many <throat> of these issues uh, was um, not there at the beginning, <laughs> and um, you know I was very proud to have him say repeatedly, Rich Madalino changed people's minds. He changed my mind because he was there. I got to know him. I understood his family. I saw him as a father and as a husband, and that changed the the dynamic. And I, and I think, um, you know, unfortunately, Senator Miller has passed away. But uh, I think if he were here today, he would say one of his biggest regrets as a as a member of the legislature was not voting for that bill. 
um, you know, he let it move through. He stopped the filibuster. Uh, but in the end, he did not vote for that bill. And I think he came to regret that. And I've heard that from many legislators over time, various bills that we move forward, that they were, they regretted that they didn't take the vote that they did. Um, I, was, I was fortunate to be on the floor, well, during the marriage debate when Senator Ron Young from Frederick, yep. um, <clears throat> an early supporter, stood up and said, you know, and then in a district that was seen quite competitive, and he said, this is one of those votes that you take because I'd rather vote for it and lose than vote against it because that was politically convenient for me. So be it, I'll take the risk. And he won easily. I, I think that people are probably more tolerant than a lot of people realize. But yep. I, I think your point about people getting to know people was really critical. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was fortunate, I mean, I was in high school and I knew a couple of you know gay young men. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, it seemed to be relatively not an issue. Mm -hmm. And later on, when I got out of college, and I had a friend who worked at a, what used to be called Great Oaks Center, mm -hmm. and a lot of the folks up there um, were LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. And we'd wind up socializing and going out dancing together, and you know, when everything just seems like this is the normal course of things, mm -hmm. it's, it really does make a difference. I think getting to know people is is important we've mm -hmm. and we've talked about this with some of the communities here who with different religious beliefs and such that mm -hmm. you know you rather than feed people's suspicions by you know being quiet and trying to stay amongst yourselves the biggest and best antidote mm -hmm. to people's confusion about people is getting to know people and understanding they're stunningly like everybody else that we know yep well just look at the numbers when you when you poll and you see how many people know someone, a coworker, <coughs> a relative, a friend who's gay or lesbian, the number is very large, yep. over 80%. And you see that tracks, the more people who know gay people, um, the higher the support for a range of rights. Um, people are less familiar with the trans community um, and you see as a result you see more reactionary policies attacking them because you know the people on the right who want to scapegoat trans people, there right. is more of a fear and a mystery amongst people who don't think they know trans people. <laughs> and it's that same, that's the same journey as more and more people get to know trans people, um, there's gonna be a different reaction. And I think over, over time, even though we've moved forward in Montgomery County and Maryland, in the other parts of the country, people will say, well, wait a second, what? I, that's not what I thought. That's not what yeah. I was told. Um, these, this person is just like me. So they shouldn't lose their house. They shouldn't lose their job. They should be allowed to, to be who they are. So that journey is continuing on this issue. It's continuing on, continuing on so many other issues. Yeah. When you mentioned religion, the struggle, <coughs> the struggle that Muslims have had in this country. Yeah. Um, for a greater understanding. The, the, the struggle that Jewish people still have in many parts of this country as people get to, uh, to, to, to know them and understand and demystify their support and understanding. And that's where, again, Montgomery County has always been a leader and a welcoming community. And you and I both know this, you talk about this, that being a welcoming community is very nice. It's very important. Yep. It's how we should be. It's good for economic development because we attract people yep. here who they know, other parts of the country, other parts of the world, they can't be who they are and follow their dreams. We get to have those talented people here pursue their dreams and then start their businesses and make money yeah. and do the other things that are so important to a successful community. And sometimes that part of the equation, even though that may not be where we started as a reason, yeah. is critically important to why this is a economically vibrant community as well because we allow people to follow their passions here. So to any of you all listening in from Florida or Texas, yeah, <laughs> pay attention. I mean, come to Montgomery County because this is a place where you can be who you are. Yep. And that's what's expected of you. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, is, it is a real thing. You know, mm -hmm. we, we've talked with people about locational issues and there are some people who have been very pointed about, mm -hmm. you know, they're not bringing their workforce to a place where the workforce isn't safe or isn't mm -hmm. welcome. Um, they don't, they're not going to sacrifice the talent and brains mm -hmm. that they put together because we have in, intolerant people. Mm -hmm. 
and you know the the other thing I've you know we know because we deal with it, you know hate crimes here we we've, we've all seen it and it's really painful when you see young people engaged in this mm -hmm. but the truth is young people don't get this anywhere but from older people mm -hmm. this is not something kids concoct in their little minds this is something they're getting from other people and you know this still is if there's anything that's a challenge here is getting you know some of the elders and some organizations to kind of put aside these kind of primitive backward beliefs and accept mm -hmm. the fact that we're all human beings yep. and move on about their business it won't harm their belief systems or the things they want mm -hmm. but it'll make for a more welcoming and whole community yep but and that's why it's it's a pleasure to be here, to be part of this administration, to be CAO, to be able to work in a community, to raise a family in this community, the community I grew up in, you grew up in, and, and to, to see that constant evolution and, and progress. And just, you know, again, with the welcoming <coughs> attitude that we have for all types of people. Yep. I was, you know, there's some controversy about, you know, the school curriculum. I got to look at some of the books and mm -hmm. like, all they've done is introduce a character mm -hmm. who's not straight. Mm -hmm. The character does, and everything else about them is like you'd expect anybody to do, except you know there's this identification that's different. And you know, people, some people, mm -hmm. fortunately a minority of people seem to be, you know, take a front at that. And it's like, I don't understand how they go through their daily lives. <laughs> since Meeting people like that's part of daily life. Yep. He's like, why is it, you know, why wouldn't you want your kids to see everybody as being like everyone else despite the differences they have that they're so much more alike? Why somebody would focus on what's different as opposed to what makes everybody the same? As long as everybody's behaving nicely, treating, treating people well, respectful, and all that other, what is all this? Why does mm -hmm. this even matter to mm -hmm. people? I will, this I will never be able to reconcile myself with how people right. feel this actually matters. And that's why it's so nice right now in this political moment in the country that we have Governor Wes Moore, Lieutenant Governor Runa Miller, people who are willing to stand yep. up and say this is wrong, challenge those things, not remain silent, but also show the rest of the country there is a way to govern with inclusion, with equity, with compassion, with social justice, and still be a highly successful and attractive community that people want to live in, which is, which is what you're talking about, the, the whole <coughs> idea of when will people from, I don't want to just pick on Florida and Texas, but Florida and Texas and other communities like it start coming here yeah. um, as they have been because this is a different, this is a different and welcoming place. Oh, I remember, I mean, Northern Virginia's had to change. Virginia's yeah. had to change oh, because yeah. they had to face that reckoning of, well, wait a second, were we going to be uncompetitive to the district, to Maryland, because our laws were so backwards and there is creative talent. There are people that, yes, they're LGBTQ people, but there are also lots of other straight people who want to be in communities that are welcoming and tolerant and they had to, or not just tolerant, but, you know, inclusionary and they realized they had to compete with us and change their laws in Virginia or they were gonna lose yep. out. And the business community, I remember the head of the Greater Washington Board of Trade saying at a meeting, that was Virginia's Achilles heel, was whether or not they could, they, they could compete with Maryland and DC on social policy issues because they would lose a generation of young people if they did not. It's, hard to, it's, nice. Yeah. it's nice to know they did, but you know yeah. there are days where you'd like, oh, maybe Tyson's wouldn't look the way it was if, it had, <laughs> if they hadn't followed that advice and, and been more liberal. No, that, that is very true. Um, I, I'm just glad we're where we are. Yep. You know, your success you know, has led to the success for a lot more people. And I know that you know, people look at you for not only being probably who was the guy who was the smartest person on budgets in the state legislature, but also for your, your courage and being willing to lead on this and mm -hmm. to have the confidence that when people understood the issue, they'd wind up in the right place. Mm -hmm. That this wasn't something you were gonna have to spend your entire lifetime. That probably it felt that way mm -hmm. sometimes because mm -hmm. it is so yeah. obvious that it shouldn't mm -hmm. be an issue. But um, you're a person that people look to for the leadership you provide and still provide.
Well, that's very kind of you. I remember Jamie Raskin once called me um, the Babe Ruth of budgeting, but otherwise a boring guy. <laughs> it's like, you know, the, okay. the type of compliment that you, you both love and you'll never forget. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it did allow me to be not the gay person, yeah. but actually for people to see me who I was and what talents I could bring on the rest of um, a range of issues. So that's why I appreciate um, being part of the administration and serving the people of the county as the chief administrative officer. Yeah. I am really thrilled with you being the chief administrative officer and uh, I know a lot of people appreciate it. So mm -hmm. thank you for joining me today to talk about this. Um, it is Gay Pride Month and you know we are wanting to make sure that everybody understands mm -hmm. the importance of who we try to be mm -hmm. and uh, that everybody feels welcome here. Yes. Um, and it doesn't change. When the month's over, we're still going to be the same place. Nice. We're, nice. You're welcome, you know, 12 months a year, 365 days and a quarter, <laughs> or 366 in every four years. But people are still, you know, part of this community. And they're always going to be treated like they're part of this community. Well, thank you. Th thanks for having me. Absolutely. <laughs>